Greetings. St. Irenaeus of Lyon is full of surprises. While being the first writer to expound extensively how the one God works throughout the one economy, through the one Christ, to bring the one human race, skillfully fashioned mud, in the power of the one spirit to share in his own divine life, he often writes in ways that should give us pause for reflection, for he seems to be thinking in ways quite unfamiliar to us. For instance, in one of his most memorable lines, and he really is a master of the beautifully turned phrase, he asserts that the glory of God is a living human being, a statement which is frequently quoted. And he then continues with words too often ignored. And the life of the human being, he says, is to see God. These latter words are often omitted, perhaps, because as no one can see God and live, the living human being, who is the very glory of God, is, for St. Irenaeus, the martyr. Again, commenting on Ptolemy's interpretation of the prologue of John, Irenaeus is emphatic that the whole prologue speaks throughout of Jesus Christ. He is the Word in the beginning. He is the Word with God as God. He is the one by whom all things were made. He is the one who became flesh. We'll turn to what that means later. Most dramatically, overturning our usual ways of thinking about God and creation, Irenaeus states, uh, states that since the Saviour existed beforehand, it was necessary that he who would be saved should come into existence, so that the Saviour should not exist in vain, without a purpose. In other words, Christ is not plan B. It is for him and by him that all things have come into existence. Christology and anthropology are closely intertwined for Irenaeus. Indeed, the whole economy is seen by him as the accustoming of God and the human being to each other, culminating in Christ, the perfect human being, the glory of God, <clears throat> and then the martyrs who follow in his footsteps. The text I would like to focus on here, from Against the Heresies, Book 4, Chapter 33, 11, also concerns both Christology and anthropology, but brings into the picture <clears throat> a further element, that is, the pure womb, which ties together both Christology and anthropology. And it does so with the same kind of perplexing character as the statements I just mentioned. But before we turn directly to the passage, we should, however, set it in context. In the fourth book of Against the Heresies, Irenaeus gives us an account of the ecclesial reading of the scriptures as carried out by the true presbyters and the spiritual disciples. Book 4, chapter 26. After recounting how a spiritual disciple, on the basis of this reading, can refute the various errors, and for several chapters he goes through the different areas that the spiritual disciple can refute, Irenaeus concludes by giving a summary statement of this true knowledge. It is, he says, the teaching of the apostles, the ancient constitution of the church throughout all the world, the character of the body of Christ according to the succession of the bishops by which they have handed down that church which is in every place and which has come down to us being guarded and preserved without any forging of the scriptures by a very complete treatment receiving neither addition nor subtraction, and reading without falsification, and a legitimate and diligent exposition in harmony with the scriptures, without danger, without blasphemy, and above all, in the preeminent gift of love, more precious than knowledge, more glorious than prophecy, exceeding all other gifts. Irenaeus then segues seamlessly into speaking about the church. She is, he says, the one who in every place, because of the love which she cherishes towards God, sends forward, forward throughout all times a multitude of martyrs to the Father. She is the one who alone sustains with purity the reproach of those who suffer persecution for righteousness' sake, and endures all sorts of punishments, and are put to death because of the love which they bear to God and their confession of his Son. 
He carries on, the persecution of those upon whom the Spirit would rest and who would obey the word of God was foretold by the prophets, who also prefigured it in their own lives because of the love that they bear towards God and on account of his word. And in so doing, however, they not only prefigure Christ, but they also contribute to the completion of the economy. He says, in the same way that the activity of the entire body is shown by our members, for the figure of the whole human is not shown by a single member but by all, so also the prophets, while all prefiguring the one, the one Christ, did each of them, in accordance with their position as a member, complete the economy and foreshadow the work of Christ connected with that member. Irenaeus then goes on in Book 4, Chapter 33, 11 to 14, to give a tapestry of scriptural quotations and allusions, exemplifying the complete figure witnessed to by the prophets. The first two groups of Old Testament quotations are also followed by the words of Christ and Paul. So he begins by alluding to Isaiah, who beheld him in glory at the right hand of the Father, while others saw him coming on the clouds, Daniel, Yet others said of him, they shall look on him whom they have pierced, Zechariah, indicating his parousia, Irenaeus says, about which Christ himself referred when he asked whether the Son of Man would find faith when he comes, and likewise Paul in Second Thessalonians. Yet others, he continues, saw him as a judge, speaking of the fire of the day of the Lord, to which the words of Christ and Paul again bear witness, and then the third group of quotations from Psalm 44 speak about the beauty and the splendour of his kingdom. And what he says is the transcendent and preeminent exaltation of all those under his reign. It's then that we have the passage with which I am particularly concerned in this paper. He says, Those again, saying, He is a man and who shall know him? And... I came unto the prophetess, and she bore a son, and his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and who proclaimed the one from the Virgin, Emmanuel, showed the union of the word of God with his handiwork, that the word would become flesh, and the Son of God the Son of Man, the pure one opening purely that pure womb which regenerates humans unto God, and which he himself made pure. Having become that which we are, he is mighty God and has a generation which cannot be declared. After this, Irenaeus then turns to a series of texts demonstrating how the prophets, this time he doesn't mention Christ and Paul, how the prophets spoke about Christ's parousia from Judea and from Bethlehem, together with the miracles worked by him, his entry into Jerusalem, his suffering and death, his resurrection and exaltation, and the new covenant he established. One who is truly spiritual, Irenaeus concludes, will look at all the other points uttered by the prophets in the long exposition of scripture, and will point out which particular aspect of the economy is spoken about, and will also make clear the entire body of the work of the Son of God, always knowing the same God, always acknowledge the same word of God, the same spirit of God, and also the same human race from those believing in God and following his word and receiving salvation formed from him, flowing from him. So such then is the context of our quotation. What's particularly arresting and intriguing about this text is not so much that the scriptural quotations from Jeremiah, Isaiah and Isaiah show for Irenaeus the union of the word of God with his handiwork, that the word would become flesh, the son of God, the son of man. We would expect that. But how these predictions are in turn explained by the subclause, the pure one opening purely that pure womb which regenerates humans unto God and which he himself made pure. As an explanatory subclause, I would argue, we should begin our attempt at the interpretation of the whole passage, one sentence, from this subclause, and then on its basis understand the preceding clauses, which themselves summarise that about which the verses from Scripture speak. So, the pure womb 
which regenerates humans unto God. It seems to me that that clearly speaks about the church, spoken of a little earlier in the passage as the one who, because of her love for God, sends forward throughout all time a multitude of martyrs to the Father. Earlier on in Book 4, Chapter 33, when speaking of the errors which a truly spiritual disciple can refute by the sound reading of Scripture, Irenaeus uses similar language with regard to the Ebionites. He says, How can they be saved unless it was God who wrought their salvation upon earth? How shall the human being pass into God unless God passed into the human being? How shall they abandon the birth of death unless they are regenerated by faith with a new birth given wonderfully and unexpectedly from God as a sign of salvation which is from the Virgin? Again, the virgin here, as with a pure womb in our quotation, is to be identified with the church, the one in whom and through whom the human being is reborn, passing into God. The most dramatic description of this, found, of this is found not in Against the Heresies, but in the letter of the churches of Vienne and Lyon to those in Asia and Phrygia, preserved by Eusebius, but almost certainly written by Irenaeus. The heroine of the whole account, Blandina, as a young slave girl, is the epitome of weakness in the ancient world, but thereby also the vessel in which the strength of God is made manifest. Not only that, but the author writes that she, fixed to the stake, epixilu, upon the wood, becomes the very embodiment of Christ himself. Alongside those, uh, those alongside her in the arena, as Irenaeus put it, beheld with their outward eyes through the sister him who was crucified for them. They look at her, they see Christ. As such, she, together with Atalus, is able to encourage those Christians who initially faltered. It writes, Through their, Blandine and Atalus's continued life, the dead were made alive, and the witnesses, the martyrs, showed favour to those who had failed to witness. And there was great joy for the Virgin Mother in receiving back alive those whom she had miscarried as dead. For through them, Blandine and Natalis, the majority of those who were denied were again brought to birth, again conceived, again brought to life and learned to confess. And now living and strengthened, they went to the judgment seat. So those who had turned away from making their confession, that is, those who stayed alive in this world, they are, in fact, simply dead. Their lack of preparation has resulted in their condition of being stillborn, stillborn children of the Virgin Mother. However, strengthened by the witness of others, especially Blandina, they were able to go to their martyrdom, and so now the Virgin Mother, with great joy, can receive them back as alive, finally giving birth to the living children of God, or as Irenaeus put it, in Book 4, Chapter 33, the mother who sends forth a multitude of martyrs to the father. Now, the background of this imagery of the pure womb, the virgin, or the virgin mother, would seem to be Isaiah. Isaiah 54. Rejoice, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing, cry aloud, you have not been in travail, for the children of the desolate one would be more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. This verse is already quoted by Paul with that interpretation. Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one. It's also a connection made by others in the second century. As the second epistle of Clement puts it, In saying, Rejoice, O barren one who did not bear, he meant us, for our church was barren before children were given to her. It's also possible, I would suggest, that another background for this imagery is a description of Eve coming from the side of Adam in Genesis 2, which is alluded to by John in his Gospel, with the blood and the water, baptism and the Eucharist coming from the side of Christ at the crucifixion. As Tertullian already pointed out, as Adam was a figure of Christ, Adam's sleep sketched out the death of Christ, who was to sleep a mortal slumber so that from the wound inflicted upon his side might be figured the true mother of the living, the Church. 
The image of Eve also seems to be behind the figure of the woman in travail, evoked by Christ in John 16. The one whose tribulation will turn to joy when a human being is born into the world. And again at the cross, the woman addressed by Christ, speaking of birth and sonship, Woman, behold your son. Whereas Eve was called the mother of the living, Genesis 3.20, all her children die. And so it is the church that is the true mother of the living, as Tertullian put it, and she acquires living human beings, those who following Christ are born through their martyric death anticipated by baptism. Returning now to our text, further points become clear. If the pure womb hearkens back to the barren one of Isaiah 54, and is also figured by Eve and her dead children, that womb is opened by the pure one, that is Christ himself, and this opening of the pure womb which, in which we are now born as living children of God, this opening is therefore that which is spoken about in Isaiah 53, the hymn of the suffering servant. Interestingly, at least in the liturgical celebration of Pascha in the Orthodox Church, Isaiah 54.1 is read as the conclusion to Isaiah 53. Christ's passion, spoken about in Isaiah 53, opens the way for our adoption as children of God, Isaiah 54.1 born of God, by baptismal conformity to the death of Christ, as Paul puts it in Romans. Christ who is the firstborn of many brethren, Romans 8.29, and therefore is the firstborn of the dead, Colossians 1.18. Or as Irenaeus puts it, for the Lord who was born the firstborn of the dead, receiving the ancient fathers into his bosom, regenerated them to the life of God having become the beginning of those who live, as Adam had become the beginning of those who die. So it is as the firstborn of the dead that Christ himself who was born from the, well, that Christ himself was born from the Virgin as a firstborn of the dead, so himself becoming the beginning of life for all those who have regenerated in his own new generation, in the same pure virginal womb. In other words, Christ's birth from the Virgin cannot be separated from his passion. Moreover, as our text puts it, it is Christ himself, the pure one, who not only opens purely the pure womb, making a path for those who follow him, but in so doing, makes that very womb itself pure. Now, if we have correctly understood this subclause, the pure one opening purely that pure womb which regenerates humans unto God and which he himself made pure, the question then arises, how should we understand the statements for which it is an explanation? That the word become flesh and the son of God, the son of man. The explanatory subclause would seem to demand that we should understand these clauses in terms of the same event and framework. Now, if that's the case, then the Son of God becoming the Son of Man would not be taken in terms of a pre-incarnate Son of God becoming human as we are, as we have since become accustomed to presume, taking the Son of God and Son of Man as designations of divine nature and human nature respectively, Rather, these terms should be taken in their scriptural usage, where in fact, Son of Man is the more exalted category. Son of God is a term that it can apply to many. I say you are gods, sons of the Most High, says Psalm 82, quoted by Christ himself in John 10. Whereas the term Son of Man, in its apocalyptic usage, and this is indicated in this context by Irenaeus' prior quotation of Daniel 7 and Luke 18, Son of Man is unique and applies to Christ as crucified, exalted upon the cross. Again, indicated by the quotation of Zechariah 12, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Christ, the Son of God, becomes the Son of Man 
through the passion, thereby opening the pure womb by which we are regenerated. Similarly, regarding the previous clause, that the word would become flesh. As I've already noted, Irenaeus insists that the prologue speaks throughout of the one Jesus Christ, so that it is Jesus Christ himself who becomes flesh. How this is to be understood is best understood in the light of the Gospel of John itself, and we also find this in Ignatius, in Ignatius of Antioch. Rather than assuming that the flesh spoken of in John 1.14 simply refers to human nature, just like we simply presume that Son of Man refers to human nature, Christ as human, the Gospel of John provides a much richer and fuller explanation of this flesh from the lips of Christ himself, the whole of John 6. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world, that is my flesh, John 6.51. Note well the switch to the future tense. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. He must ascend the cross to be able to descend as the living, the heavenly bread, the, the life-giving bread, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man. As Martin Mencken puts it, Jesus is a bread from heaven, not just as a human being, but as a human being who dies on the cross. Jesus must ascend the cross to descend as a son of man, offering his flesh and blood as food for eternal life. So, the word becoming flesh, the son of God becoming the son of man, the pure one opening the pure womb purely by which we are reborn unto God. All of this indicates the union of the word of God with his handiwork, foretold by the prophets. It is the exaltation of the Son of God as the Son of Man, the word, Jesus Christ, becoming flesh, the bread which descends from heaven. This is the union of the word with his handiwork, the earth in his hands. And the locus for this transformative and unitive exaltation is the womb, the virgin, the virgin mother, which he himself makes pure through his opening of the womb for us also to be reborn in the same womb, united with the word and the spirit, and so ascend to the father. Remember, she constantly in all times and all places sends forth a multitude of martyrs to the Father as living human beings, the glory of God. The connection between Irenaeus's Christology and anthropology has frequently been noted. What emerges now from a careful consideration of this passage is how ecclesiology, the womb, is the connecting link between Christology and anthropology for St. Irenaeus of Lyon. <laughs>